Hi, everyone. Um, we are going to be talking, this is another lecture at, um, this time we're going to be talking about metabolic syndrome and diabetes, one of my favorite things to talk about. So um, I should be sharing my screen, um, except I don't see the thing around it. Let me make sure that I'm, sh yes, I am sharing the right one. Okay, so hopefully you're seeing what I'm seeing, and I'm not doing this blindly, but we, um, I want to look a little bit um, at explaining metabolic syndrome and diabetes. And pretty much one of the ways that I talk to people about um, metabolic syndrome is that obviously it's a syndrome, which means it's a conglomerate of a bunch of things, but pretty much it's the freeway to diabetes. Um, and so it's really not only just diabetes, it's also cardiovascular disease and stroke, which of course are the number one killers among Americans. So when we look at the diagnosis um, and what it really means is that we're saying that um, a certain group of population, uh, meaning the person, has a couple different criteria that meet the um, the definition. So when we look at people, um, some of the things that we are looking at here is, I'm going to point my clicker over here and say the waist circumference. So I really want you to be familiar with this, that when we talk about men uh, that have a greater waist circumference than 40 inches, we become, it becomes a concern. So remember, um, you might be actually in your um, assessment class uh, when you take Dr. Herzig, you guys are going to be measuring people and you're going to be using um, the waist circumference. And in women, it's going to be greater than 35. So you're going to need to know those numbers um, just to know what they are, regardless if it's going to be for metabolic syndrome or not. What we know is that people that have a large waist circumference um, usually also have an increased BMI. So we, that's when we diagnose, we would never just diagnose someone with just a BMI for being overweight or obese. So we also look at the waist circumference and that's kind of the demarcation line. Um, the other thing that we look for is triglycerides. Um, so what it means is that your um, triglycerides, which what are triglycerides? They're lipids. And in this case, it's usually uh, the glycerol backbone and the fatty acids traveling around um, in the body. And they are very, they stick and they stick typically to carbohydrates. So we can usually tell when people have high triglycerides that they've also have a diet that's high in carbohydrate load. But um, if it's greater than 150, um, that's when we start to get worried. We don't want the triglycerides in the blood um, higher than that. And then of course, you guys have been trained on the LDLs and the HDLs and learning the healthy cholesterol. And that's the one you want to get higher in the LDLs, which is the lousy or loser that you want to have lower. And so um, if you, you want to, if you have people, this is what they typically have. They'll have low, high density. That's the one they want to get higher and it should be higher. So in men, um, when we are diagnosing this for a criteria of having metabolic disorder, it would be less than 40. Um, and women would be less than 50. So ideally, we don't want that because that's that's a bad thing, okay? And you don't have to meet every single one of these criteria. You need to get a certain percentage, um, usually four. One, two, three, four, five. Maybe it's three out of five. Um, you guys need to look that up because it's not. I'm blanking on it right now. I've had a ton of filming this morning. Um, okay, so the next one is elevated blood pressure. So that means that the systolic um, is greater than 130 or the diastolic is greater than 85. Um, we get very worried. When this number, the 85, the diastolic gets really high, um, that's when people have strokes. So that's the number we look at for strokes. But in this case, criteria for metabolic syndrome means it's going to be either one of those. And then an elevated fasting blood glucose greater than 110. So that's not diabetes, but that is pre-diabetes, right? So again, it's this free way to diabetes. Um, so keep that in mind that this is the criteria that we, do, we, we um, uh, diagnose uh, this disease. And usually, again, these people will have abdominal obesity. They're going to have some of this going on, maybe not all of it. Remember, we had had the, the discussion in class about dyslipidemia rather than hyperlipidemia because dys means this part right here, the LDLs are, I mean, the HDLs are low. So that's why it's dyslipidemia, not hyperlipidemia because the, eight, the LDLs might be um, high, but the HDLs are low. I hope I said that right. The other thing I want you to know, and I bolded it here, is that American, African American and Asians are at risk um, and they only need to have two of the markers. So I believe other people need three and they need two. But again, don't fully quote me on that. Go back to the book because my brain is dead. So, okay, moving on. 
looking at the next one. So again, we're going to, how do we screen for this? So we're gonna typically take a waist circumference, we're gonna do a fasted lipid, lipid panel, and we'll do a blood pressure. And that should give us what we need to figure out the diagnoses. And then what is our new, um, nutrition intervention? Well, um, it's very similar to what we would do for cardiovascular disease, what we would do for diabetes, because they're all on the freeway to the same place. So in this case, we want to reduce any type of um, the diseases that they might be progressing with, especially if they had dyslipidemia or they had more of the higher blood sugars. We're gonna you know, kind of head um, looking at those macronutrients of where we need to go. Um, and that's where we're gonna find out which problem it tends to be more high. Now, of course, if you have one that has both, then of course, then now you're dealing with two different macronutrients that you are gonna have to limit. And you know, it's, it's tough for people to, uh, to, to work on this, but they need to know that if they could lose weight two to 10% um, or three to 10% of their percentage of body weight, then their risk for these things goes down. And so one of the things that we might even just be doing in this whole thing is just trying to get them to lose a little bit of weight, increase their exercise. Again, increasing exercise helps what build your HDL levels, which if they have low LD, uh, HDL levels, this would be good for them. So it's just kind of working um, and figuring out what's gonna work for them. But usually weight loss is gonna be one, decreasing the amount of lipids in their diet and um, possibly looking at carbohydrate load as well. Okay, all right, now, diabetes. The one I really wanna get into, and I feel like I'm talking really fast, but this is because these are mini lecturettes and I really wanna try to cover as much as I can. So I've been asking you over the entire semester and last semester, can you differentiate between type one and type two diabetes? So keep in mind that I'm really wanting you now because this is gonna be the population that you have most likely will be dealing with diabetes where they're going to be your clients and you're gonna to need to help them. Because even at this point as adults, some of them might not know if they're a type one or a type two and you're gonna to have to be able to help them differentiate what they are. So in this case, the ideology here is listed as an autoimmune response. Uh, again, usually happens earlier on in age, but that doesn't mean we have this new thing or it's not real new, but we call it LADA, which is latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. And that can come on in their 20s, 30s, and now even in their 40s. So at some point, they have an immune system that attacks itself. Again, usually happens when they're younger and they are completely dependent on that point on um, exogenous or outside insulin because their immune system attacked their beta cells. Now, type two is a little different because it's more insulin resistance and it's developing over time. So that's where, although at some point, a type two diabetic could actually end up on insulin and um, they're not gonna know if they're type one or type two, how you might ask them is, did you start on insulin immediately or did you start oral medication first and then you progress to the pills you know, years later? If that's the case, they're more likely a two where they've become insulin resistant, but eventually they lose their beta cell function completely and they have to be on exogenous insulin. So either way, um, you can have type ones and type twos that are on insulin, so keep that in mind. That's not always the best way for you to figure out who they are. It's asking them, when did they start on insulin once they were diagnosed? So physiological effects of diabetes though. So these are the things that I definitely want you to know. I want you to know that when people, when they have diabetes, sometimes or even when they don't know they have diabetes, these are the symptoms that most of them will, that will they'll get. And so they'll notice that they have frequent urination. They have increased thirst. They have increased hunger. They have increased fatigue. They usually could have weight loss, not weight gain, and blurred vision. Now the reason for these things here is we're gonna look at in the next slide and that has to do with the pathophysiology of the body and what's going on. And I want you guys to be able to start to be able to identify and explain those. But keep in mind, this is a very advanced part and um, it's gonna take time for you to uh, do this. So I wouldn't necessarily test you too much on this information, but if you find diabetes fascinating, I encourage you to pay attention to these parts here because this is something that um, when you deal with diabetes, this is very important that you are able to comprehend and understand. Um, and then we also call things when we have diabetes either micro or macu mac macrovascular. And so what I mean by that is that micro means small and macro means big. And so when we look at the, the vascular complications, there's macro, which is big, and then
and then there's micro, which is small. So when the blood sugars get really, really high and they have to go through small, small, small blood vessels, that's micro, okay? And then when they have to go through bigger vessels, that's macro. So, you know, people that have diabetes are more likely to die of a heart attack. That's a macular vascular um, complication of diabetes is dying from a heart attack. Now, the micro would be the fact that they have high blood sugar over a long period of time um, and their kidneys is giving out and they end up on dialysis because they have had diabetes for so long. That's because the um, smallest cells, I mean, capillaries and blood, blood areas that have to, to get are usually in one's hands, feet, the kidneys, and the stomach. So those are the ones that get the microvascular problems showing first. Diabetic um, neuropathy, where they can't feel their hands and their feet, that's because they've had so much blood vessels, uh, blood sugar trying to get through the small vessels that they burst them and they no longer work. They just can't feel it. Okay, so moving on. This is something that is not in the textbook. And again, this is just additional for some of you that are advanced and want to learn this. Um, but it definitely, in my opinion, helps everybody learn. So, but this isn't something that I'm going to be testing you on in that you'd have to fully explain these, but I want to show you something. So this is what most people know diabetes and they kind of look at it from a perspective of, well, it has something to do with your pancreas and it has something to do with your liver. And so we look at it as those two organs being the only two organs affected by diabetes, but it's not the case. And so this particular endocrinologist, Dr. Ralph DeFranzio, he was the one that kind of coined this term, the omnius octet. And so this slide is a slide that is used um, to talk a little bit about the omnius octet, meaning that it talks, this organ is the same, this is the pancreas, hopefully, but there's two different things. There's alpha cells and there's beta cells. And most people know that the beta cell function um, is impaired, but most people that have diabetes don't know that their alpha cell is also impaired and is not working properly. Properly. It's actually overworking and it's actually um, never shutting off, but we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. But so these, when I try to explain diabetes to people, I want them to explain all the organs that are involved because then we actually have to treat all of the organs. Um, besides helping them with their diet, this is the treatment modalities that are available to people with diabetes. So it's very important to kind of look at this and see, you know, how this cycle plays out and, and why that it is. So what I've done for you is I've put the entire YouTube video that um, shows Dr. DeFranzio. It's an older video, um, but he's at, at a university and he, or he's giving a talk about the Omnia Octet and he's really explaining it. And then after that, he talks about the therapies. So the entire video is an hour and nine minutes. And so for some of you, it gets really boring, especially because he's talking to physicians. And so a lot of the terminology, things that he's using, it's really hard to follow along, but it's also very challenging. So I encourage all of you to try to get through it because this is the kind of stuff that you will be exposed to. And when we go to conferences, this is what our conferences look like. And this is the level of the people that are speaking at the conferences. So you want to get as much out of it as you can. But um, there is really good information um, for about... 20 minutes, so 20 minutes in, so starting at 19 minutes, 54 seconds, and then it goes all the way till about 20, I think it's like uh, 28 minutes and 45 seconds. So that time frame is the most important time frame for you to explain this omni octet, omnius octet. So I'm going to go ahead and let that play um, for a couple minutes, and then I'm going to jump back in and try to uh, reiterate what it was that he was talking about. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try to move this over on my screen, and I do hope that you're still seeing this. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and play it. So I'm gonna hit play. Major breakthrough in the last decade has to do with the complexity of the This is Dr. DeFranco, but pay okay. attention to his slides. So when I gave the Banting Lecture in 2008, the Banting Lecture was titled From the Triumvirate to the Ominous Octet a new paradigm for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. So the disease is much, much, much more complicated than we previously imagined. So the core defects, insulin resistance in liver, insulin resistance in muscle, and the cell failure, they're still here. But now we have a whole bunch of other defects that we have to deal with. We're starting in the upper right, the fat cell. When you eat, you take in excess calories, you, keep, you put them into the fat cell, and you store them as triglycerides. As long as the fat stays there, it can't hurt you. But it turns out, when you start to gain weight, or in a diabetic, even if you're lean, your fat cells are resistant to insulin. Insulin is the brake. It's the anti-lipolytic hormone. 
So now when your fat cells become resistant to insulin, you break down the triglyceride, you release the FFA into the bloodstream, and what happens? Elevated FFA causes insulin resistance in muscle. And liver. Elevated FFA poison your beta cells. And on a long-term basis, elevated FFA kill your beta cells. Okay? So FFA are a very important part of the pathophysiology of the disease. Okay? The top, the gut. The gut is a giant endocrine uh, organ. <clears throat> and it secretes two endocrine hormones. GLP-1, we learn like peptide 1, and GIP, gastric inhibitory polypeptide. So when you eat a meal, you release these two hormones, and we're going to come back and talk about them in more detail because they're very, very important from the therapeutic uh, standpoint. And these two hormones together account for 70% of the insulin which you release in response to a meal. If I knock out either of those hormones in anybody's body in this room, I guarantee you I make you diabetic. Okay? So these are not trivial hormones. Okay? Every day you eat three times a day. The only reason why you maintain normal glucose tolerance is you release those two hormones. Now, what goes wrong in the diabetic? Okay? It turns out there is a problem uh, with the beta cell's ability to respond to the GLP-1 and GLP. There's severe, severe, severe resistance to these two hormones. What about the circulating levels of GLP-1 and GIP? They're basically normal. So if you look at all the studies, some studies show a little bit of an increase, a little bit of a decrease, normal. But on mean, there's no major change in the plasma level of GLP-1 and GIP. The big problem is the beta cell is resistant to GLP-1 and to GIP. And we'll come back to this because we have a therapy. Uh, for uh, this. In the upper well, 9 o'clock, we have the alpha cell. Now, we've known for many, many years that diabetics have elevated fasting glucagon levels, and the glucagon levels don't suppress normally during the meal. So these elevated glucagon levels drive the glucose production. In addition, studies that we did many years ago <clears throat> do show that the liver is hypersensitive to glucose. So now you think about this. You go to sleep at night. Your brain has an obvious need for glucose. It, where does that glucose come from? It comes from the liver. So what's regulating glucose production from the liver? It's insulin and glucagon. You have a liver that's resistant to insulin. Number two, you don't have any insulin. Number three, you have a liver that's hypersensitive to glucagon. Number four, you have too much glucose. These four abnormalities conspire to drive hepatic glucose production throughout the sleeping hours, and that's the major cause of fasting hypoglycemia. So in the treatment of the diabetic, you've got to knock down the glue gun, and of course you need to augment uh, the insulin. And if you do that successfully, you'll suppress hepatic glucose production, and then the diabetic, when they wake up and start their day, will start with a fasting glucose of 100. Okay? The kidney. The kidney also plays a critical role in the pathophysiology of the disease. So if you become diabetic, some strange things and very paradoxical things happen at the level of the kidney. So in URI, our, our threshold for spilling glucose into the urine is about 180. So if I plug in an IV and I start infusing glucose and I raise your glucose from 80 to 120 to 50 to 180, Zero glucose appears in you until I get to 180. Above 180, okay, I've now exceeded the threshold. And the maximum reach of as the kidney dumps all of the glucose in. Okay, what goes wrong in the diabetic? You get to 180, no glucose. You get to 200, no glucose. You get to 220, no glucose. Okay, the threshold has increased markedly. It's a whole new physiology. You can't read about it in any textbook. You can only read about it in papers that you just described. And it's only in the last year that this has all become very clear. So if you have a hemoglobin A1C that's six and a half, which you'd probably love to have in your patients, the threshold at the level of the kidney, which is no glucose, has already gone from 180 to 205. If you have an A1C that's seven and a half to eight, the threshold has gone from 205 to 200. 
220 to 230. If you have an A1C that's not in the threshold for spilling glucose in the urine, it's 240 to 250. So if you think about this, remember in the old days, you used to measure urine glucose in two patients. Well, first, the urine glucose is way behind the blood glucose, and virtually no glucose is appearing in the urine. That's why we never got anybody out of control uh, in the old days. And as you'll see, we have drugs that will block the reabsorption of glucose. Now, this defect cannot start the disease, but once your blood sugar level goes up, it now plays a very, very important role in maintaining the high blood sugar. And then we also know that the brain has become resistant to insulin and a whole host of other neural uh, and peptides and other hormones. So Dr. Gain report showed many, many years ago, if you take a normal, healthy individual and you just give them one to two units of insulin, enough to get a modest increase in the insulin level, but not enough to lower your glucose, you turn off the appetite completely. Well, if you look at people who are overweight, they're all insulin resistant, they're all hyperinsulin. Do they stop eating? And the answer is no. Okay? Your brain has become resistant to insulin. What else does your body secrete that shuts off your appetite? The insulin is secreted in one to one ratio with insulin. Your brain is resistant to the insulin. PYY, the most powerful interactive hormone in the human body. Your brain is very resistant to it. GLP-1, which comes out every time you eat a meal, that powerful interactive hormone, your body is resistant. When your fat cells expand, they release leptin. Your brain is resistant to it. There are a whole host of other abnormalities that I can think of too. This is why 90% of people, 48 large prospective studies, 90% of people, they're good at losing weight during the study. One year after the study, they have gained back virtually all of the weight. Okay. Your brain cannot overcome all of these physiologic disturbances. You may think you can. You will fail on a long-term basis. Okay. 48 studies, 48 failures. Okay. That's the person who comes out of the study. So those of us in the diabetes obesity field now believe that in addition to behavioral modification, you are going to need some kind of medication to go with the behavioral modification to really make a major impact uh, in getting people uh, to lose uh, weight. So, let's, let's do the okay. so when you think about so, it, this is a very complicated disease, okay? And you are all right, so again, if you were interested in this, hopefully you were taking notes while this was going on, um, because I find it very, very fascinating. And again, I think a diabetic would find it very fascinating. And so it's important to teach them some of these things. So you can go back and watch it again and again and again if you want, um, because he talks about a lot of different things and he's talking very fast and it's also poor video quality. So it's just, I had it as loud as I could. Um, but just to kind of reiterate, again, when we look at this, we're talking about different organs and we're talking about how they all, it's very cyclical and how one actually, one defect causes a defect in another one, which causes a defect in another one, which causes the defect in another one. Um, so hopefully you took that away from it. Hopefully um, you were, you, you know, you're very familiar with um, the role of the pancreas. We've talked about how the liver stores sugar, okay, and how it can let out sugar. Um, that's the glucagon, you know, when we store sugar, it's in the form of glycogen and when we convert it back to glucose, like, so what glucagon's role in that whole process. And if you don't know that, or one of the things that I could suggest is that you go back um, and maybe, um, I can actually probably post a couple of videos for you on um, metabolism, the entry level. So, because it's talking a lot about some of these different things. It doesn't talk so much about like GLP-1 and GIP, it talks a little about GIP, but it also talks about PYY and leptin. And so when he was talking about those, I hope that your little brain kind of was like popping up in your ears. We're like, hmm, what's, what, what, what's going on here? So let's talk just about a couple of these that I think are important. So first of all, the alpha cell, not the beta cell. The alpha cell has increased glucagon secretion, which means it just doesn't shut off. So it's constantly trying to do what? Thinking that your blood sugars are low and letting out more sugar all of the time you know, just putting out more. And that's when Dr. DeFonzio was talking about the fact that we have patients that, are on, that have diabetes and they would go to bed 
and they would eat, you know, a decent meal and not something excessive and not something, you know, that was really wrong. And, and they would go to bed and then they'd wake up in the morning and their blood sugars are sky high. And they're like, I don't know what I did. I ate fine. I didn't eat a bad meal. I ate a healthy meal and I still wake up in their high. So why do I want to keep trying? Well, that's because of that hepatic glucose production that's happening or what we call, um, and what Dr. DeFonzio talked about as far as, you know, having a um, fasting hyperglycemia. Remember hyper is high. So in the morning, your blood sugars are still high, even though you had nothing to eat. That's because of what's going on in the middle of the night, not to mention there's also hormones going on, which he didn't talk about, uh, cortisol and some of these other ones. But um, for the purposes of this, I want you to kind of get that. I want you to get that the gastrointestinal tract here um, plays a huge role, and that these hormones that are um, released, this GLP-1 and this GIP are these gut hormones, um, and they become severely resistant. And when that happens, that that's problematic because when we look at this, the gut is actually responsible for 70% of the insulin response after a meal. And I find this very fascinating because this is also my epiphany that I had about the gastric bypass, which you guys were learning about in the last section. And when I had a discussion with a bariatric surgeon and he was telling me, he said, Erica, do you understand if they, if I have a diabetic who goes and has a gastric bypass, a ruin Y, has a gastric bypass, they will no longer need their diabetic medication. And I said, yeah, of course, after they lose the weight, they're not going to need it. Like that, that makes perfect sense. Three to 5% decreases blood sugars are able to handle. No. And he said, wait, no, Erica, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is a patient that immediately after has a gastric bypass, no longer needs its medications. Like immediately, not, you know, after they've lost, you know, enormous amounts of weight. And I was like, what do you mean? And that's where we get into, they don't know the mechanism yet, but the GLP-1 and the GIP that happen kind of resurrect themselves and are no longer resistant to patients when they have a gastric bypass after they've reattached and did all of that work. So I don't know, something there. But also when we look at treatment mechanisms, there's a reason why you want to have stock in GLP-1 and GIP, because these are really good regulators to help people with diabetes and or prediabetes and or people with weight loss, because he also talked about the weight loss studies and how do we get people to keep the weight off. These two hormones are gonna be instrumental in this process as we move forward in, in what research is going to show for us. So I'm very excited about that. Now, looking here at the adipose tissue, Hopefully you were listening to when he talked about and you were able to identify that lipolysis, what is lipolysis? Like, can you explain lipolysis? So it's this metabolic pathway, right? In which lipid, lipids are broken down. And if they happen pragmatically and everything goes well, then they are, they're fine. But if you have someone who's gained weight, so even if they're not diabetic, but they've gained like 20 to 40 pounds in a shorter period of time, what they notice is that this whole metabolic process doesn't actually happen properly and what ends up happening is that you have these free fatty acids traveling in the blood, i.e. triglycerides. When we start to look at those triglycerides in the body that we were talking about earlier for metabolic syndrome, here they are. Okay, so these free fatty acids are going around. They're not going into the fat cell. And what are they doing? They are causing more insulin resistance and specifically in the liver and in the muscle. So now we have even more insulin resistance. So here's what we're saying. We're saying we have someone who has got increased hepatic glucose production because they've got pancreatic alpha cells going bonkers. We've got the beta cell who's about ready to poop out because it's trying to secrete so much insulin, but the insulin that it's secreting isn't really working. And now here's this other part over here, the kidney. If we get our blood sugars high, which we have blood sugars that are high, what was the number that he said when he talked about this? The glucose threshold where we would spill glucose into our urine. If we did a urine dipstick and was looking for glucose, what would we find? We would find in a non-diabetic patient that if their blood sugars got over 180 milligrams per deciliter, that they would actually have um, glucose in their urine. Now, what we're finding with the diabetics is that's not the case. They can be all the way up to 200 to 250 before we're even going to show that. So what does that mean? That means that there's glucose reabsorption happening. So it's not exiting the body. It's not going into the urine where it should be. And it's staying and reabsorbing in the body, i.e. the bloodstream raising blood sugars. Then this whole cycle starts over again. Yikes. Okay, the last one I want to talk about, you guys already kind of know about muscle, is this brain part. And that again, also because we've been talking about weight loss and we've been talking about people and how do we come up with maybe medication 
medications that might be helpful for people for weight loss, this is an area to look at, is that our brain does control that. First of all, it does need glucose, so we know this. But the other part is these neuropeptides um, that we have, like PYY and leptin. We talk about you know feeling hungry and having appetite, feeling full. All of those things are controlled by these neuropeptides in our brain, and if they are not turned on properly, then we're not going to have people that are going to feel full and hungry. And so when you talk to a diabetic, one of the things they'll tell you usually is that they feel hungry all of the time. Well, that's true because they have all this insulin in their body. I mean, excuse me, sugar in their body, but it's not going to the places that it needs to go. And so therefore the other part is that the brain is kind of insulin resistant and it's not sending out the message like, okay, you're full, you're okay, you're good, you don't need to eat more. So it is very, very cyclical. So I hope that you're seeing that. Now, again, some of this might've been a little bit more, um, at a level that's hard to comprehend and you're, you're you know, feverishly taking notes, you can play it over and over again. Don't have to know that much for the exam, but I just want to introduce this to you because as you get into Dr. Herzig's class, this is exactly what we talk about when we look at medical nutrition therapy, okay? All right, now, when we go ahead and look now, how do we screen for diabetes and how do we assess diabetes? So now we know how to explain what it is. What am I gonna do? So we're gonna look at risk factors for diabetes, right, and prediabetes. What we definitely know is that if people that have it in their family, so parents or siblings with diabetes, we also know if you have had a history of gestational diabetes. Remember when I told you, if you have gestational diabetes, you're 80% more likely to get diabetes within 10 years. Okay, if you have an elevated A1C, that's a hemoglobin A1C, it's the test that we do that gives us an average of your blood sugar over the last three months. IFG, what does that stand for? What do you think it stands for? Impaired? fasting glucose, or IGT, impaired glucose tolerance. That means you've taken the test. Okay, we also know that there are certain racial and ethnic backgrounds that have it higher. So if you're Mexican-American, if you are African-American, if you are Native American, if you are Asian-American, you are gonna have a higher risk for having diabetes. Sedentary lifestyle, not exercising. How much, how many minutes do I have to do a week? 150, hold that thought. Okay. The next thing is if I have low HDLs and high triglycerides or cardiovascular disease, okay, dyslipidemia, remember we talked about that. And then women that have also had polycystic ovarian disease, which we did also talk about. So this connection is really there. So if you have someone that you are seeing and they said, oh, I had PCOS when I was younger, then we might want to start talking about getting some screening assessment um, going on for diabetes, okay? So what are we going to do? We're going to look at these things and how are we going to help them in their nutritional assessment. So we're going to look at their weight status. We're going to find out what their current eating pattern is like. We're going to give them more knowledge about diabetes. We're going to help them try to be physically active. We're going to look at lab values, their medical history, their medications, their social and financial and environmental, and any kind of past education or experience they've had. So we have to do quite a bit. So usually when you see someone with diabetes, they're gonna to come to you multiple times. Now, this can get tricky because why? Sometimes their insurance only allows them to come back so many times, so we have to get all of this education in. So for Medicare, we can only see them eight times, okay? After that, I can't see them anymore. So I can't get all of this in in eight times. Um, now, the good news or bad news, depending on how we look at it, is if the doctor can write another referral um, that their diabetes has changed, had a substantial change, like their A1C change, then we can write and get additional ones. But what we're saying is when someone is diagnosed with diabetes and they have Medicare, they get to come see the dietitian eight times in their lifetime and that's it. So again, policy changes need to occur here, but this is how it's going to play out for now. Okay, so what am I gonna do? What are my clinical goals for these folks? What do I need to help them with? So the first thing that I have to do is I have to normalize their blood glucose and their glucose metabolism. Blood sugar control is my number one thing. And if that means that I can't get to nutrition education because I can't help them normalize their blood sugar, then that's what that means. So we focus on normalizing their blood sugar. Maybe it's stress that's doing it, it's not nutrition. We still need to make sure that we normalize their blood sugar. Okay, we want to prevent or slow the progression of the diabetes complications. We don't want people to end up on insulin. I don't want a type 2 diabetic to have to be on insulin. It's not good. But at the same time, if their body needs it because their body can't use the endogenous insulin that it's being because it's so resistant, maybe they do need an exogenous source to see if it can help it along a little bit. Um, and then we want to normalize the lipid levels and the blood pressure. That's because those are number one killers among them. They're not going to die of the diabetes. They're going to die of this complication, which is that. Now, here's the big one. 
Take a look at this one. Patient-centered care provides a collaborative interdisciplinary care team. So what does that mean? So we hypothetically want every place to have this thing. It's called the Diabetes Self-Management Education and Support, DSMES. So when people go for diabetes, they want to go to a diabetes care center that has this because that means they have the whole interdisciplinary care team. They have the endocrinologist, they have the dietitian, they have the nurse, they have um, the pharmacist and they have the psychologist. So we're handling them all, right? And sometimes there's even an exercise physiologist, if we're lucky. Okay, but the reality of it is, is that that's not what most people have to treat their diabetes. If you ask people when they go to diabetes, even if they've seen a dietitian, they're very likely to say no. Okay, so we need to have that interdisciplinary care approach. And then secondly, we need to make sure that it's patient-centered, that the patient has control of their diabetes. The idea here is not to just educate them um, and just teach them these things. We want to teach them self-efficacy. We want to teach them so when we're not there that they can still perform and do the things that they need to do for their diabetes and take control of their diabetes because they do have control. But a lot of times they feel helpless because they say, I have to go to the doctor, then the doctor ups my medication, I have to go to the doctor, then he downs this, he tells me to do this, he tells me to change this. So it's, it's the doctor dictating everything and not the patient. And so, you know, giving them back a little bit more of their power and trying to explain to them, no, they have the power, but the doctor's gonna be helpful and you can be more helpful to the doctor if you tell the doctor these things. Okay, now, diabetes, medical nutrition therapy, what are we talking about here? We're talking about flexibility and individualization. So we want to achieve glycemic control, right? Achieving glycemic response, okay? And also getting their weight and getting their lipid and their blood pressure levels down. But how on earth are we going to do that? That's where it becomes very, very flexible and we have to, you know, take it by each person. So that I'm never going to give the same you know, plan to every patient because they're so individualized. Um, especially when we look at the next one here, which is responsiveness to cultural preferences and maintain eating pleasure. So I think I've mentioned to you before, I worked with the American Indian population and I worked with the Hispanic, Hispanic population. And I would never, ever, ever tell a Hispanic patient that they can no longer eat tortillas. That's just not what I would do because that's not responding to their cultural preferences and their eating style. Now, we might talk about how many tortillas they eat and how often they eat them and you know that kind of thing and see if we can't adapt and adjust but we're still going to need to make sure that we maintain that through all cultures um, we want to practice guidance to help them through every day we want to pr promote and support healthful eating patterns and then we want to have that ongoing counseling that we need to have with the education and the follow-up and then the other thing that i really am big on is trying to get them to understand is that they need consistent meal plans and this is hard in our day and time and especially you know if i think about right now with covid and everything that's going on um you know how people's diets have fully changed and how we're going to see the repercussions of this for months to come because how stressed they are. And if someone has diabetes and they're stressed, their blood sugars go up. Plus they're stressed and maybe they have food insecurity right now. Or they're an older person, they have diabetes and can't get to the grocery store. So they're eating whatever they dropped off or the community food bank brought by for them or you know something like that. And it's all cereal. And it's raising their blood sugars just amazingly. So um, we use different types of education with them. There's a plate method that we can use. Carbohydrate counting has worked for me. That's what my my go-to kind of preferences when I teach patients. Um, they also use the diabetic exchange list, which you will spend a lot of time working with Dr. Herzig on, so I'm not going to cover that. But I want to talk a little bit about carb counting and kind of what we do. And I want you guys to start looking at, um, you know, how we kind of classify this. So I'm going to look at the next slide because this is the one that kind of can help you out a little bit. When we teach someone to carb count, what we try to teach them is the portion size and the number. Okay, so when we look at this, what we're saying is that one slice of bread is about 15 grams of carbohydrate, if you're looking at that. So bread's one slice right here, this is 15 grams. One serving, 15 grams, okay? If they're gonna have peas, corn, winter squash, half a cup cooked, 15 grams. So it's just kind of teaching them. Look at this, 10 to 15 French fries. So how many French fries do you think are in one small or medium size um, McDonald's if they got at, if they got something from McDonald's they need to be eating a kid's meal because that's the only one that probably has 10 or 15 and it actually probably has a little bit more than that it might have 20 to 25 I haven't counted lately okay now so looking at this what we typically will tell people um, is to start learning these things one small fruit fresh fruit is four ounces um, that also means when we look at a banana, sometimes it's half of a banana is 15 grams. So if they ate the whole banana, then they have 30 grams. So in this case, when you look at this one, let's see, is there tortillas on this one? So it says a six inch tortilla. So 
what does six inches look like? Six inches is a half of, an in, of, a, of a foot, right? So it's a very small tortilla. So if they're not eating very small tortillas, then they might need to count for two or three, okay? Depends on the size. Um, and that's where we kind of take, give or take a little bit on, you know, how many of them that we're gonna have and, you know, what does that look like for each person? But this is kind of carbohydrate counting. Most of the time we tell people to try to stay between 45 and 65 grams um, of carbohydrate um, at a meal and then maybe 15 grams at a snack. Okay, we're almost done. This is my last slide. And this one talks about diabetes and management of it from a perspective of physical activity. One thing that is extremely important, and then people would say this, like once I have high blood sugar, why should I care? Because I can't get it down. The answer they can, okay? The best way to get it down is to exercise. Okay, exercise lowers blood sugar, okay? And it also has the effects of exercise actually has an effect on your body for about 32 hours. So that's more than 24. So what it means is if I exercise today, I still can get better insulin response from my muscle cells and letting the glucose um, and insulin work so that it goes into my cell and gets stored as glycogen in my muscles where it needs to be so that it can be used later. Um, that process can be happening for 22 you know, like 32 hours. So it means I work out today, I still can get some of that benefit tomorrow. So we really wanna get them exercising just from that perspective. Now, there is one thing that I want you to know, and that is that in certain cases where people have really high blood sugar, then it, one thing that exercise has done is actually increased it. It was a small study, it wasn't small study, but it was a smaller study that was done, but yet it was still a study that's respected. And so we set the guideline at about 250. So if their blood sugar is greater than 250, we don't recommend that they exercise. But if it's less than 250, then they should go ahead and exercise and help bring their blood sugars down. If they're greater than 250, they need to sit the exercise out. Now, the pharmacotherapy side of type 2 diabetes is enormous, and it's impossible to keep up with all the drugs that come out on the market. Um, but what I want you to know is most common, and we've talked about this, is that metformin, or we call it glucophage. Remember that one we talked about? We treated it with PCOS and how common it was and how safe it was to even have with our gestational patients. Um, that is the usual number one response that doctors are going to start patients on when they have diabetes. They might try diet and exercise for a little while. If the numbers keep coming up, then they're going to add glucophage metformin. And remember when we talked about the hepatic lipid, I mean the hepatic production that the, the increase the glucagon and so the liver just goes crazy and starts letting out sugar and they wake up with high blood sugars in the morning. This is what metformin does is it tells the liver, don't let out so much, suppress it, suppress it, suppress it. So that's why it's one of the number one things that can help. But over time, that's not going to be the only thing because that omnius octet has other issues going on. So we tend to have to add medication to that. So these are just looking at some of the different um, medications that we have that are out in the market that are there to um, help. But again, that's something that you'll talk about in um, Dr. Herzig's class, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. Um, this is also talking about herbal remedies and other dietary supplements. Um, so just be weary of some of these ones. Um, you know, there's been many that's tested. Uh, I worked, like I said, with the American Indian and the Hispanic culture, and so some of the patients that I worked with, they would go see like a medicine person or a curandero, curandera. Um, and I had one person tell me that they were going to go to Mexico and the, the, the curandero that was there was going to cure their diabetes. Now, I knew that that from a Western medicine, that there was no way that that was going to happen. But the patient went, and then the patient actually came back to me. And when the patient came back, um, I, we had a discussion, and the patient knew that the diabetes didn't go away. But what did they eat when they were in Mexico is they ate a bunch of Nepalis. Well, that's fine. If that's what they want to do, and they think that that's healthy for them, when they came back, they wanted to continue to eat that, and their question was, could they? And of course, my answer then was yes, because it was a vegetable-based, very low carbohydrate um, item for them, and it was perfectly fine. So, you know, sometimes the herbal remedies are okay, but, you know, be, be cautious of some of these things um, when we look at that. Uh, a lot of, like, there's a lot of uh, studies out there about cinnamon and how cinnamon can help regulate blood sugars, and it can, um, but it requires a lot of cinnamon. Um, you know, so most people aren't usually eating that much cinnamon to actually get the effect of it, but if they're taking cinnamon, is it going to harm them? Is too much cinnamon ever toxic? No. So could they continue to take it? Sure. Right, so these are what we do. Um, but, you know, so just stay alert on some of those. 
So I hope that this has given you kind of a broad overview of metabolic syndrome and diabetes itself. It's a bigger topic. And again, I smashed it in and I spoke very fast. Um, so you can go back and replay it if you need to, but I wanted to make sure that you had something to go along with the lecture slides um, that I could help you with. So again, I will see you for your next lecturette um, very soon. All right, have a great day.